You are now tuning in to the Mind Body Podcast, where fitness experts and life coaches share their secrets on taking your mind and your body to the absolute best. This is the advice you wish you heard years ago. Get ready and take notes as we expose the raw truth behind achieving amazing natural physique and strength and ultimately become a stronger version of yourself. Guten Tag, ladies and gentlemen, it's Lidor Dayan here, and on this episode of the Mind Body Podcast, I have a special guest, like I always have. <laughs> he is known as the skinny guy savior. He is Vince Del Monte. Vince has the most popular skinny to muscular transformation stories in the world. But before he became one of the top fitness experts in the world, he was the poster boy of the I can't gain weight and uh, I will never find a woman story. Vince became known as the skinny Vinny. He was 140 pounds at 6 feet tall. Talking about hard gainer, damn. So without further ado, let's begin the interview. Hey Vince, how's it going? Very good, Lador. I'm very honored to have you here. Uh, I gotta say that you were one of my inspiration when I was uh, just starting out as a trainer. I remember seeing uh, your videos and Ben Pokolsky, the MI40, uh, uh, and uh, I, I saw a lot of uh, your YouTube uh, videos, and I want to thank you very much because it helped me a lot. You're welcome. So, uh, for those uh, that... Uh, don't really know you, please uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how your fitness journey began. Sure, where do I begin? I think most people online know me as um, former skinny guy, Skinny Vinny, mm -hmm. who um, has essentially dedicated his um, platform to helping skinny guys build muscle in the most direct and efficient way, man, uh, efficient way possible uh, without drugs without bogus supplements and in less time, as that was my story. You know, I struggled to build muscle all through high school, all through university. I used to be a long distance runner. I lived with all these buff dudes in university, so I had this curiosity and fascination with going to the gym. And I never realized its impact it could have, not just on your physical life, but on other areas of your life. And uh, that was my story. You know, I was the poster boy for uh, the guy that couldn't get the girl and for you know, that weak mm -hmm. Scotty dude that always wanted everything that I thought muscle could get me. You know, that's my story. And, you know, I've been telling a story ever since um, I launched my online fitness business in 2006. And um, there's a lot of skinny guys out there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, they're getting more and more confused uh, nowadays with the state of the internet, with so many different social media platforms, you know, you don't know who to believe, you know, you don't know who's a fake natural, you don't know who's genetically gifted, you don't know who's in this for just, uh, you know, cash, you don't know who's in, who's in this for other people's truly best interests, so people are confused more than ever now, and, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of people follow my work because I've been doing this for over 10 years. You know, I've had this online business since 2006, and uh, it's truly a passion of mine. I feel just as excited about helping guys today as I did when I first started 15 years ago in the gym and then 10 years ago online. And um, really, people follow along with me because I feel like one of the things I've tried to do my best at is evolve. Quite a lot of guys don't evolve. Yes. And, you know, they're, they're not, and they're even afraid to admit, you know, where they've been wrong or if they've changed their mind on something, they don't want to appear like they're contradicting themselves. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people build trust with me because I just like, you know, things I've taught years ago, I don't teach anymore. And, and, and people get it. They understand the context. It's like, well, Vince is on the journey. He's learning along with us and he's keeping us up to date. He surrounds himself with smart people. Like you mentioned, Ben Kukowski. And I know a lot of your other guests you've had on the show are, are guys that I look up to and I learn a lot from as well. And uh, people value that. Yeah, it's always about being a student of the game and not trying to, I know it all. You always learn and you always, uh, you can make some mistakes along the way. And, and uh, only those that see themselves, themselves as, uh, like, I always want to learn more than, uh, and I always, uh, 
I can admit that if I say something right now and in five years it's it's not uh, it's not true. So I, I'm okay by saying that, right? That's pretty much what I do, you know, right now. I'm, I'm in my basement right now at a new home here in Toronto. And, um, you know, this is a full-time, this isn't just like a hobby of mine. This is a business. You know, there's about a dozen people that work for me. And we uh, are dedicated to putting out the best uh, information products possible for helping guys achieve um, their goals. I'm not really into uh, helping guys optimize their metabolism, whether it comes to fat loss or building muscle. I'm really passionate about helping guys customize workouts to their muscle fiber type, learning how to work with their body instead of against their body. And the thing I'm probably most passionate about these days is mechanics and just helping guys optimize their movements in the gym. I think that's where most guys, if not all guys, have the greatest room for improvement. And, you know, the analogy that I use is uh, most people are just kind of, if you look at, you know, getting to your destination, and you look at all the different tools you have, if you use uh, the analogy of, a car, most guys are obsessed with what I call the gas pedal. Mm -hmm. It's the only tool they have. It's just harder, 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 gas pedal, gas pedal, gas pedal. And they forget that, you know, when you hit that gas pedal hard, you better have good you better have good steering. And if you don't have good steering, you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna crash and burn, and this thing and might this sport of bodybuilding or weight training, whatever you call it, is gonna end up taking more from you than giving back. So, you know, if you watch my YouTube channel, a lot of people follow my work. Uh, because I'm not just telling you what to do, but how to do it. And, and what I'm teaching isn't based on my opinion. It's based on the world of physics and biomechanics. So I'm sharing stuff from a world of irrefutable principles. And people are looking for that. They're looking for the truth. They know that there are better ways of doing something. And in this day and age of social media, the favorite quote is, well, whatever works for you. And I think that's a load of crap. Mm -hmm. Because whatever works for you might be working now, but it might be... Maybe you might be pay, you might pay a price down the road if you're doing things wrong right now. So there are better ways of doing things, and I'm not a fan of that. Or whatever works for you, saying. I know that you are also uh, uh, a good believer in, on uh, time under tension, and uh, there is a lot of controversy about time under tension, using tempo to build more muscle. And I want to know uh, your point of view about it because there are so many experts that says that. Tempo is the, the last thing that we want to, to look at. We're trying to build muscle. Yeah, I, I would, um, I've heard that before. I've heard those arguments before. I actually was on a podcast with uh, Scott Abel the other day, and we actually uh, disagreed on the call uh, together about this point. And, um, you know, he feels, and I know a lot of people feel, that any kind of variable that takes you outside of the actual quality of the workout is a non-productive tool, if you will, but I have the exact opposite perspective. A lot of people have the inability to control their muscles, and they need a tool like Tempo to ensure they're controlling and isolating the thing they're trying to challenge. And, and you know, we know that it's not what you do, it's how you do it. So it doesn't matter if you do 20 reps with 400 pounds if they all suck. We know that the body will always chase the path of least resistance. And we know that the body will disperse tension to as many different pieces as possible. We know that the brain's primary function is to protect. It's about safety. And it only cares about protection and safety, not about stimulating muscle tissue and isolating. So we have to have tools that allow us to challenge muscle tissue and not disperse tension through all the joints. And I think a lot of these people, I challenge them, I say, well, your insight on this is short-sighted. You're looking at research that says, yeah, maybe not worrying about tempo now produces better results, but they're not looking at what happens to those joint structures over five years, 10 years, 15 years. So you have to look at what you're doing in context to the different realms of time. You know, we have an immediate realm of time, a residual realm of time, but we also have a cumulative realm of time. So everything you do in the gym today is going to have an impact in three to five days from now, but also three to five years from now. And I feel that people that aren't training with the temple are, in fact, going to cause more harm to their joints down the road, and they're going to end up like not even being able to bench press 135 pounds without having a short, sore shoulder because they neglected tools that gave them control. Yeah. All right? 
Yeah, I so, totally agree with you. I can say for myself, like when I switch from like the all time under tension uh, method to like, okay, I just will try to lift heavier uh, from time to time. And then my shoulders got uh, to hurt and my elbows and uh, and my, my knees. So I, I, I totally agree with uh, you need to, to know that you, you are training uh, good enough with good tempo and you are uh, putting your muscles uh, under tension. Exactly. So I always say this and um, it's a great saying. The currency of muscle growth is control. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't control the weight, you can't challenge the muscles. And if you can't challenge the muscles, you can't grow the muscles. Right. All right? So it's, it's very, very important to own the weight. You have to own the movement. You have to be creating muscle disadvantages. I teach that muscle disadvantages create muscle effects, muscle growth. You have to stimulate muscle, uh, muscle tissue. You've got to create damage within the muscle. You've got to create stress within the muscle. And that all requires control. And if we so look at the uh, beginners, does uh, a tempo workout is better for them to make their body understand how to walk with weights better? Absolutely. So again, I think we also need to put this in a little bigger context too. So I like this saying. This is worth writing down for your listeners. Mm -hmm. If you're training for muscle, you want your muscles to work the weights. If you're training for strength, you let the weights work your muscles. All right, and I think a lot of this debate comes around like, what's the context here? Like, is it are we talking about strength? Or are we talking about yes. muscle? Mm -hmm. um, yes, there's going to be carryover from goal to goal, but you need to ensure you know what your primary goal is. What's your priority? The whole word priorities come from the root word prior to everything else. So, what is more important than everything else? There's no such thing as priorities. That's a contradiction. You can only have one priority. Like prior to everything else. So the priority, if it's to stimulate muscle tension, to stimulate muscle growth, we always need to be in control. Now, I do believe that every tool can be taken to a, a, an equally and opposite extreme that becomes detrimental, such as like, you know, now you're, you're, now you're counting so slowly or, you know, you're taking such an extreme loss the intensity of the workout. Um, I do feel that there's a time and place to like kind of, use tempos as guidelines and um, you know maybe for a beginner yeah you tell them hey kid we're gonna do a four count on the way down just to kind of break some bad movement patterns mm -hmm. but eventually they'll be able to graduate out of that right we never want to become a slave to the tool the tool is simply a tool and once we start getting better mind muscle connection where well, we can start putting more effort and effort into what the tempo is supposed to achieve which is contracting your muscles against resistance then yeah in the gym you know, it, it's not going to be a big deal. You know, the program prescribes a three-second temp negative, and we're doing a four-second negative. Like, I'm not, I'm not a Nazi like that, but I do think that there's a time and place to use it as a stepping stone to improve mind-muscle connection, and then, um, you know, continue to use it as a tool. I mean, I have some programs where we have six, seven, next, six, six, six to eight-second negatives, um, and that's for like a you know, programming for like muscle damage, but that's not the entire program. That might be like six, you know, six weeks in a you know eighteen week program. So again, I'm using it as a tool, not the entire toolbox. So you know, I, I never want to be like, I hate when people like people want to get experts. They want them to fight together because their life's so boring. Mm -hmm. They want to see uh, two experts go at it. I'm like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't reality TV. So it, it's like, um, don't put me in a can. I understand its weaknesses, I understand it's a tool, but I do do see like in the big picture, temple training has more value than not. And, and if not we, just from and a short term perspective, from, from a long term perspective. And if we, uh, you said about the uh, mind-muscle connection, uh, is that really something we should fo always focus on even if, we, if we're like uh, trying to build more strength, like below six reps? No, um, that's a fantastic question. I have programs where when I go to the gym, I'm not thinking about my muscle connection. I'm not thinking about targeting a certain muscle group. You know, there are phases in my program where rep ranges are just as you described, like everything's like, you know, you know, maybe three to six reps kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get that weight from point A to point B. The goal is to be explosive. The goal is to generate what's called... Um, 
peak tension. So we want to create peak tension within a rep, um, not peak fatigue. You know, this is a, there's a difference. So, so yeah, in context of building strength, I tell my clients, I do not want you thinking about intent. I do not want you to be thinking about one particular muscle group. I want you to move that weight explosively from point A to point B with perfect form. I want the weights to work you, not you work the weights. But that, again, is in context to a specific goal for a specific individual for a specific period of time. None of these are generalities that you just kind of throw out to everybody at once. And um, if we look at the techniques, there are some techniques like... Uh the NOS techniques or the NOS X that uh, personally I used in my program uh, are these techniques really help to gain more muscle uh, do we really want to go to failure and why is it just on the last sets fantastic question just to, to be clear um, those are Ben Pekowski's techniques yeah I know. Uh, no, it's not and I'm fully aware, you know, I've worked with Ben for years. He's been a coach of mine. We've got co-creative products and all that. Uh, absolutely, those are great ways to um, stimulate my favorite mechanism of muscle growth, which is cell swelling. And obviously, there's different, you know, um, mechanisms trigger. You're going to obviously induce a lot of muscle damage with um, those techniques as well. But, yeah, the big thing with those techniques is that they're like sledgehammers, mm -hmm. right? They're very powerful. Yes. Right? And um, when we're going to the gym... You know, we don't need to use a sledgehammer on every single set. So we have to always ensure that whatever we're doing in the gym, we're recovering from. And this is also worth writing down. I, I learned this in one of my first program design courses from Ian King, one of the great Australian strength coaches way back in the early 2000s. And he wrote this up on the board. It was, it was a little equation. And it was this. Training plus recovery equals training effect. Mm -hmm. Training plus recovery equals training effect. And the training effect may, may be being strength or size. And everybody's obsessed about the training. I bet everyone on your podcast right now, they're going to the gym, they're working hard, they've got the training piece down. It's like they're doing the right amount of training, but what they could optimize is their recovery. And they're either doing, um, most likely not, they don't have a sufficient amount of recovery built in. So their body isn't able to do super compensate and get better and um, they're in fact getting weaker and smaller over time so you know I teach that you know you are what you can recover from you are your physique the way you look today is based on what you've been able to recover from from the stuff you've done in the gym how can you know but uh, how uh, how much do I need to recover like it's something like it's it's a uh... Some people see it as mental thing, like they see, oh, no, no, I'm recovered, I'm okay, like, uh, no pain, no gain, I need to go to gym. Well, there's different systems in the body that require recovery, right? So you have, you can, I think you just kind of refer to it or as your metabolic system, you know, your muscular system. Yeah. Uh, but you also have a central nervous system, you also have a hormonal system, and you also have an immune system. These systems all take different periods of time to recover. So you might be metabolically or even psychologically recovered, but hormonally you're not recovered. Immune system is not recovered. And these systems take a longer time, so you have to have built-in deloads, you know, every, I'd say anywhere from 6 to 18 weeks, 6 to 10 weeks, you've got to be taking time off, a half a week off, a full week off, especially if you're natural. If you're natural, you have to be taking time off. And... Um, People just don't get that. And I always tell people, if you don't need to take any time off, you're not training hard enough and you're not training smart enough. But when you're saying uh, time off, it's like totally off the gym or just going 50% uh, off in the weight? Yeah, great question. Um, I've done it different ways. Again, you kind of use biofeedback to determine that. I've taken um, entire weeks off and it's just like literally nothing. I've also done, you know, 50%. Um, off where I go to the gym and I just do like maybe two sets of 20 for five or six exercises. Um, I've done deloads where I follow the same program, but I cut the, um, I take the program and instead of doing, let's say it's like four sets of everything, I might do like one set of everything, you know, so there's different ways to allow your body to super compensate, but the, the primary thing is that you're considering that what you've done the previous six, 10, 15 weeks has created a cumulative fatigue. 
and it requires a substantial amount of time to recover. And I want to spell out the key word there, time, T-I-M-E. There is nothing in the world that can replace time, not even drugs. Right. Everybody eventually needs time to recover. Yes, and uh, you're also considered to be as the skinny guy savior, right? So, uh, for those skinny guys who have a lot of hard time building muscle, what do you think is the biggest problem that preventing them to gain more muscle and uh, weight? Oh, man. I would go probably back to recovery. You know, they're probably doing too much. Uh, I, I find that most skinny guys, they need to take a day off every two to three days, um, three days maximum, so like a training split for an advanced guy might be three days on, one day off, two days on, one day off, repeat. Uh, for somebody a little less um, adapted, uh, one, two days on, one day off, two days on, one day off, or two days on, one day off, one day on, one day off, one day on. So, you know, four workouts over seven days. So, so really just tailoring that recovery ability to the individual's recovery capacity. And, you know, I have, I've got some guys who are now in their 40s and, you know, in their 50s who, you know, I prescribe a program, there's five workouts in the week, and they can't do five workouts in the week, but if they do those same five workouts spread out over two weeks, they see phenomenal results. And they're like, I just, there was just too much in the same week. And they just have to spread the workouts over beyond a calendar week. And giving guys permission to spread their workouts over a longer period of time, understanding that it's training plus recovery that equals the training effect, is some of the simplest decisions guys can make. But it does require that courage because they're like, but shouldn't I be able to? But who says? Like, who says that you're supposed to be able to do four or five workouts over seven days? Mm -hmm. That's all just dogma, tradition from bodybuilding magazines and from, you know, guys that can do that who are taking drugs. So you have to really, really be courageous enough to make your own training decisions and customize things, even though they may look very different than what everybody else is doing. I think the world is going to good direction this year. It's like when you look at back then and now, like people are smarter now and they... They seek for answer, the real answer, and uh, and uh, also all, all the people that try to advertise themselves like know that people are smarter. So uh, you you must always educate yourself and know uh, the real uh, true be, uh, behind the building muscle and uh, not fall into part like for all these myths that uh, has been for so many years. So. In a world that's constantly changing, what advice would you give to all those young guys out there who are trying to, to get more attraction and follows but still not having much uh, to advertise themselves on social media because there are so many fitness guys out there who are trying to, to bring their name out. So what would you suggest them to do? I want to get really clear on what you stand for. You know, the guys that have the biggest followings are, are typically pretty polarized. Uh, whether, you know, you'll probably find like there's guys online, you either love them or you hate them. Mm -hmm. and, and for, you know, it's like a football game, right? You go to a football stadium, half the stadium is booing for one team and the other half of the stadium is cheering uh, for, the, for the one team. So it's like, you can't be afraid to come out and say what you need. You know, I'll probably piss a bunch of people off with what I just said in this interview. And I didn't say it to piss people off, it's just because I believe in what I'm saying and that some people are going to disagree. And I think a lot of fitness dudes are just too afraid to say what they mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're too or, or they're just not clear on where they stand personally. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not telling people to be controversial for the sake of being controversial, but I'm telling people to become clear on what you stand for. Because that's going to, you know, polarize a lot of people, but it'll also attract a lot of people. You know, I talk about building muscle with baby weights, and I get laughed at by a lot of people. But then I get a lot of people that email me privately, and they tell me, man, I wish I watched your videos 20 years ago. I'm 45 now, and I can't bench press more than 135, and I got to do all my reps over 20 because I burned up, I blew up my shoulders trying to, you know, train like Branch Warren in my 20s. And like, you know, I, Ronnie Coleman used to be my idol. You know, I looked up to these guys, and now I'm a mess. This guy can't do what he loves. So I think you really got to choose your idols 
your role models carefully. And you have to understand that building culture, I'm kind of going off on them. I'm not going back to fitness advice. But yeah, I think for a fitness expert, they have to understand, they have to be in this for the long term. Um, you know, you have to be in on this for the long term. And I think the cream will eventually rise to the top. To the to, to the crop to the top. Sorry, like what you're doing right now, the door. You're interviewing some really high level authority guys, like you know what they're talking about, and people are eventually going to see, like, wow, this guy's really committed to only getting the best on his show. I can trust this guy. So there's just the amount of time it takes to gain people's trust online now is far greater than it was years ago. Years ago, you know, when I first started, and there wasn't as much noise. Mm -hmm. There wasn't as many competing uh, people, platforms. People weren't living on their phones like they did, you know, they, like they do now. Um, so I think you have to be prepared. Like this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Right. You have to be very clear on what you're doing, and and then you just have to get on the on the train and go along for the ride. You know, the next thing is it just takes time. So kind of like building your body. So. I think what you're doing too is really good. I think you know collaborating with high-level experts is probably one of the fastest ways you can become uh, more popular. And um, they said you, you hear the famous saying, "What's the face? What's the most? What's the quickest way to become a celebrity?" No, what is it? Hang out with other celebrities. <laughs> yeah, but I, I believe like uh, uh, what's the most important thing, like you said, it's consistently. And uh, the more you do it over time, uh, so you will get the result. But most people are lack of it because they don't have something inside of them that push them. Like they don't have a vision. They don't uh, really uh, see through just like the fame. You know, like uh, when you see that uh, it's something that it's more than just yourself. When you see yourself as, as a leader, as uh, someone who is trying to seek for uh, the best results, uh, the best answer for others, and not just for yourself. So uh, you will attract this. Exactly. I, you know, I was talking about this the other day. I do these things at my house for uh, five guys a month. They're called M5 Mentorship Days. And we discussed the five M's of becoming a better man. We mm -hmm. talked about muscle, money, mission, motivation, and mate. And uh, you know, one of the things we were talking about were, was the number one thing that drives people to becoming successful. And, and at the end of the day, it's what you just said, you know, it's being passionate because you are going to hit roadblocks. And if I'm trying to like, let's just say I'm trying to make a lot of money in the weight loss space and it starts getting hard. And I'm in the weight loss space because I just heard there's way more money to be made selling products to people there because there's just way more people and there's way more females that buy stuff online and I'm like I just want to make money now. As soon as the going gets tough, it's going to be ten times harder for me to press through if I'm not passionate about it. And that's one of the reasons, probably the main reason, I'm still in the muscle building space. You know, I still help guys with fat loss and that, but I'm still dedicated to my number one passion. And it's what, you know, a lot of people, I was looking at a guy's um, event a few weeks ago, Brandon Carter, there was 45 guys in the room, and they were asking me the same question. Um, actually, Greg O'Gallagher, a guy who's got a big YouTube channel, asked me, Vince, what's your number one piece of advice for uh, building a sustainable business? Mm -hmm. Because um, you don't know this, Lador, but uh, maybe even some of the guys that you um, interviewed don't even know this, but, you know, I started online in 2006. There are a lot of guys that I started with that are no longer around. Mm -hmm. like but you still gone. keep going. They're, they're, and this is the beauty. They fizzled away. And there's a lot of guys online that you think are killing it, but they're going to fizzle away because they're not in for, they're not in this for the long haul. I mean, even just look at six pack shortcuts, you know, Mike Chang checked out. Yes. You know, the dude, like 10, 15 million dollar year company, the guy checked out, like what happened over there? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into anything, but um, I see, I can name a whole bunch of guys who just checked out. They're, they're, they're out of the space. And I, I really truly believe that if you're not, if you don't find your true, true calling, your true passion, you're not going to be around for more than four or five years. Right, right. You're absolutely right. And when you, you're not, like, most people like trying to avoid it. Like uh, when their heart is like beating and they know this is it, this is what I want to do. They still avoid it and they tell themselves a story like, no, no, I'm not ready yet. Uh, I don't need to do it. People will judge me. Like, uh, how will I... I will do it and they, they just 
get uh, too many doubts in their minds. So uh, they just don't start because they always like people who are just starting. They they see like oh I have so long growth. So uh, as long as you are in a mindset of like uh, I can't be happy until I have something and I need uh, like. Uh, uh, something uh, outside resource uh, validation that uh, I'm good enough so you will never make it so you got to understand that you are enough like uh, in the, uh, right now so when you appreciate the moment and you start like okay let's do it and let's continue and uh, focusing on the now and how I can contribute each and every single day so you will become more and you will attract what you want I totally agree, man. It's all great stuff. You know, I always tell guys, like, partnerships will definitely be the fastest way to accelerate your popularity, your brand, your the amount of transactions you make, etc. Uh, so, you know, that should definitely be a part of your business model. You know, going to events, networking, creating value for others, building relationships. Like, not fake relationships. I mean, real relationships. Like, I've got so many relationships with guys. I mean, there was over a dozen guys at my wedding. Like these are these are dear friends, close friends. Our wives are friends. Our kids are growing up together. These aren't just like let's be friends so we can make money together. And sure, it kind of starts off a bit like that. Let's be honest, but mm -hmm. it eventually evolves to a real, genuine, authentic relationship. And um, I think that's a key piece of like becoming, you know, popular in this state. You know, because you can piggyback on other people's you know platform success, trust they have with their following. So that's really important. Uh, but then at the same time, what I always tell people is like you have to look at that as a bonus. Mm -hmm. You know, I use uh, Jeff Cavalier as a great example. Um, he's got Athlean X, you yeah. know, massive YouTube channel. Uh, I think he's one of the biggest YouTube fitness channels now. Um, he doesn't believe in affiliate promotions. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, uh, but uh, you know, he doesn't promote anybody's product. He just promotes his own brain. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't agree with that, but that's his belief, and that's what he does, and it's it's worked for him. So he's been able to build his name and brand. Uh, just by being, you know, just he's probably had a big vision of like, you know, being a P90X kind of bit brand, and he saw like, hey, I need to just be true to this brand, and I don't want to do anything with anybody else, and he doesn't, and he's made it work. So like, you have to be, you have to have that kind of mindset, right? Where if you do get partnerships, they're a bonus, but you can't rely on other people to make you successful. That's not their job. And that's just like gravy. That's 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 dessert. That's but that's not like what you're relying on, or else you're never gonna make it. Yes, and I think a lot of it is about focus too, right? So how would do you stay focused and not get distracted? Because many people just get overwhelmed or distracted by uh, daily stuff and daily activities. Like uh, you are also married, so how can you still uh, maintain everything and not getting distracted by? All the other stuff that's going into your life and it's really committed. Yeah, that's a great question, man. I mean, just the fact that you're aware of that resistance, that friction, those distractions, like that's half of that. You got to first acknowledge that that's normal. Like, you can't feel like a bad person if you're always feeling pulled in different directions. That's just the state of the internet. It's like you have to stop, like, thinking, like, like you're a bad person. People are. I feel like a lot of guys put a lot of guilt and shame on themselves because they're like, I'm always getting, I'm losing focus. I, how can't you? I mean, you've got like a million things in front of you every single day. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've set up some systems and um, I have a very specific work schedule. You know, I have uh, a very, you know, it's taken years to even just like perfect it. But, you know, I have a schedule where the first hour of my day is spent doing what I call uh, batch tasks which is just like crap that needs to get done, returning emails and checking stats, but I only limit it to one hour, all right? So it's the first hour of my day. And then I have another block of time in my day called MIT, which is, which stands for most important task. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, I'll be writing, you know, sales copy or creating a product or doing, you know, high leverage things, you know, working on a new project, collaborating with somebody, high leverage stuff. And that's for three to four hours of the day. And then I finish the day with another hour called batch tasks because, you know, when I disconnect from the world and I go into work mode, high productive work mode, you know, things accumulate, you know, you know, emails come in that don't get answered and need replies, you know, i got to you know, just make sure the, the machine's still turning. So I spend another hour at the end of the day to clear out batch tasks. And again, so that's my structure from Monday to Friday. 
and how do you handle with procrastination like if you are really walking out and now okay I'm going to write an article and you said okay I'm gonna do two hours of writing out and after 15 minutes you see that your mind is getting distracted and you're starting to do other stuff or you're uh, starting to use your iPhone or something so how you you're being aware and not uh, getting to procrastination um, I take a lot of caffeine <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, I had bumped my caffeine dose up from uh, 225 milligrams to 450 milligrams plus 800 milligrams of alpha GPC. Three, uh, what is it? Three grams or 300 milligrams of tyrosine? And, uh, what else do I take? Um, I take a couple grams of acetyl L carnitine, and I take uh, what else do I have in my magic stack? Um, Do you believe in L-carnitine? Because uh, lately I've uh, interviewed James Krieger and he said like, uh, that L-carnitine has no scientific evidence or something like that that it can help. Yeah, but you know what? There's a, ton of, there's a ton of supplements that have no scientific evidence, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's just a study. That's just like one study. Like, I believe in self-experimentation. I know these guys would uh, you know, take me to the you know take me to the stake if they heard me saying this, but <laughs> I'm a big boy now, I, I know where I stand on this stuff. Um, there's certain supplements that I take, like glycerol, which, you know, there's no scientific evidence, but when I use it, I get incredible workouts. You know, I believe in self-experimentation. Um, some of these studies aren't long-term, some of them are short-term. Maybe they're right, maybe it's just placebo effects, so I'm certainly open-minded. I'm not, I'm not arrogant to think that everything I do is optimal and perfect, but um, I certainly rotate supplements in and out. Uh, maybe it's another piece of the stack that's helping. Maybe there's a deficiency in me that, you know, the, you know in terms of why this is helping. But there's so many variables, man. Um, I, I always look at things from a big picture perspective, context. And at the end of the day, I take responsibility. Like, I don't rely on PubMed to school feed everything, every decision I make. I'm, I'm happy to experiment, spend my own money, and... Um, kind of come to my own conclusions. I definitely like to use science as a starting mark. And if I'm hearing over and over and over again, like I see all oh, carnitine's a waste of money, um, maybe I'll run an experiment. But to be honest, it's like, it's not like the highest. And there's certain supplements that I just take because I know that work. But then when it comes to like programs I create and recommendations I make, you know, I, I, I draw the line. Like I'm not going to write, I'm not going to tell a client to take a supplement if there's not like strong evidence because they're going to ask me and say, hey, it works for me. That's not sufficient for me. Mm -hmm. um, so when it, I kind of draw a line in what I use personally and what I recommend to clients. So I'll tell people, I've been straight up with certain people. I mean, you know, there's a lot of supplements that show only research in animals or there's no long-term studies to be done on them. And I say, hey, there's no research that's been shown to... Uh, make this, you know, show effectiveness of the supplement long term or there's, there's um, it only works in animals, etc. But, you know, but they use it like, oh, I swear by this supplement, I, I can't go off of it. And um, I'm like, okay, well, that's that's a decision. And um, so I definitely value the science, but I'm not a slave to it. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, my, no, it's not my, you know, no nonsense, man. Like I preach results and I preach, you know, I, I, I preach results at the end of the day, right? I don't preach just one or the other. You know, I'm not a part of just the science-based camp. I'm not a part of just the results-based camp. I'm a part of, like, or sort of the real-world camp. Like, I'm a part of the results camp, the one that can't, you know. So so you have to you have to have courage to make your own decisions in this industry. That's another big thing, you know. Um, you got to have, like, a self-education, right? Like, uh, Tony Robbins always says, nobody will care about your health as much as you do so you gotta know you gotta know more uh, because you can't let others like uh, tell uh, be 100 percent that what they tell you are uh, correct right because you need to know you need to understand more and, and this is a podcast right so you and i we're talking casually the way i'm talking to you is the way i would talk if we were out for dinner if we were in the gym you know i'm just talking real like Yes. I'm not going to write an article on acetyl L carnitine, you know, mm -hmm. and try and get the rest of the world to believe. Like that would just be setting me up for a ton of attack and be like, Vince is, uh, doesn't believe in the science. I'm like, I don't need that. Like, there's a lot of things that I do personally that I'm more than comfortable telling others and doing myself and continuing doing because I have 
the validation, the self-experimentation, the track record to support the, the decision I've made. Uh, but then I, again, I always draw that line in the sand and say, hey, uh, I'm not going to recommend this to you because of that. So um, if you want to try it, here's how I felt it helped. But I kind of know which, I have a, kind of my go-to supplements that are like safe bets if someone challenges me on it. I'll be like, hey, there's a ton of research to support this. And like creatine, it's like beta alanine. Um, you know, there's a couple of go-to supplements that, you know, caffeine, those are like my top three big supplements that people will ask me, like, what can I invest in that, like, has all the scientific support in the world that, like, I'm not going to really waste my money. I probably point people to those three things. I'm like, it's pretty hard to not see results from those three products, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. And, um, yes. So we start with those ones and then we can go from there. And the last questions that I always like to ask uh, the people that I interview is uh, what legacy would you like to live long after you will no longer be among us? I got you with that one, huh? <laughs> you didn't expect it now. <laughs> I'd have to come from my family, right? I mean, I know what people will say on social media about me when I'm gone is going to be way different than how my family really knows me. I think one of the big things for me will be that I was a present father. You know, that's the most challenging thing for me right now, to be fully engaged. Not fully engaged when I'm present with my kids. I obviously have hours where I'm away from them, which I can't do anything about because I have to work. That's a normal reality. But when I'm not working and I'm around my wife, when I'm around my kids, that I was present, uh, that would be my first goal. And... Uh, from just, you know, social media, from like, you know, people that never met me, but kind of just know me through like podcasts and YouTube, etc. It would be that uh, he was the real deal. This sure. was the real deal. You know, he was, he's had more impact on all of us combined. He's been attacked multiple times by many authorities in the industry, but like the guy just keeps on rising, he keeps on moving, you can't keep this guy down. Like he's, he was very clear. So, I think, uh, you know, Vince never gave up. He was true. He was real. I'll, probably ask, and I'll stop right there. <laughs> and you are an, isp an inspiration for others because uh, I see you as inspiration as well. <laughs> so, Lito, Lito, Lito I, could, I could talk about myself for quite a while here, so you probably, <laughs> don't, wanna, you, you probably don't wanna do that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you heard it from the skinny guy savior Vince Del Monte. So I thank you very much for your time for being in my podcast. It's truly an honor to have you here, and uh, I hope everybody will listen, uh, will take some notes, and use the information that you gave them. So where can we find you, Vince? Best place to find me would be YouTube, and to subscribe to the YouTube channel, turn notifications on. So it's youtube.com forward slash Vince Del Monte. Uh, I, I would recommend you go there, subscribe to the channel, and then you can find out about my work through the YouTube videos. And if you like what you hear, you can uh, you hear free gifts that I give at the end of all my videos that you can um, sign up for. Okay, thanks again, Vince. Thank you for your time. Okay, we'll speak soon. If you enjoyed this interview or any other one from the Mind Body podcast, feel free to subscribe to my podcast at iTunes, SoundCloud, and at my YouTube channel. Also, feel free to share or leave a message at the comments below because your opinion is really important to me. Just like I always say, leaders create leaders and we all here to grow together. For more information about fat loss, gaining muscle and taking your mind to a whole new level, check my site at www.lidodayan.com. Till then, never, ever forget to smile. See you soon.